Okay, so let's look at uh, how they actually engineered this. So the capabilities of the what became the core asset base, the control channel toolkit, were developed over six major incremental releases of increasing functionality to the spacecraft C2 customers. So you had mirroring the uh, organizational structure, you had a domain engineering and architecture process. So a combination of understanding relevant domains, requirements engineering, architecture definition and architecture evaluation, all those practice areas rolled up into the domain engineering and architecture process. And then you had component development um, or component engineering creating the components. Application engineering, that part of the organization that acts like internal product builders. And then a formal handoff to uh, test engineering to um, validate the reusability of the entire CCT package. Sustainment engineering to manage the relationship with the asset producers and the asset consumers and a training organization that brought people up to speed with uh, things like uh, why you need an architecture, that it's not just a set of components, and why you need to evaluate the architecture with respect to the quality attributes that were identified in the domain engineering and architecture phase. So the architecture and their whole approach to architecture evolved over the course of the six increments from the earliest point at which it was just a toolkit to no we really do need an architecture and in fact we do need to have multiple views of the architecture depending on what the architects need to reason about it and in fact the, um, the two architects again uh, were very receptive to the idea of bringing in architecture discipline and documenting the architecture in multiple views. They actually went beyond just Philippe Krustin's 4 plus 1 view to create an additional set of views that they felt was necessary for uh, understanding um, the CCT asset base. The idea of the, the multiple view of architecture approach is that there's no view or representation of architecture that will allow you to reason about all of the properties of the architecture. So you can have a modular view that looks at the static structure of an architecture, but if you're trying to reason about behavior at runtime, you need things like processes. Uh, so interacting processes is a very different view from the static structure you would get in a module decomposition view. There's also what's called a deployment view, which is how you allocate the software structures to physical processors. So Philippe Krustin came up with this seminal idea of a multiple view approach to architecture. He created four basic views and a plus one set of scenarios that would tie these views together. And the SEI book on documenting software architecture is largely an extension of that idea. You create as many views of the architecture as are needed to support the kinds of reasoning that you need to do about the architecture, whether it's reasoning about allocation to physical processors, reasoning about runtime behavior of processes and threads, or reasoning about code structure. And then documenting the whole package with an additional set of guidance for how these views relate to each other and what the important architectural drivers are for the architecture. So it's a very nice way and in fact it's become widely accepted now. There's an IEEE standard on documenting software architecture that incorporates uh, multiple views. So the CCT people created the domain specification document that, or the domain definition document that I mentioned. The domain specification document contained a set of UML diagrams. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention the tool support for this was they used rational rows to support the uh, 4 plus 1 view of architecture. They used slate for requirements and uh, clear case, clear quest for uh, tracking what they call their uh, discrepancy reports. 
So the domain specification contains the uh, UML diagrams. The architecture model document talked about, first of all, why you need an architecture and the significant architectural drivers for the architecture. And it also, they also produced a reference architecture for ground stations. The reuse guide then is what we would call the product builder's guide or the uh, production plan for how you take CCT assets and build a complete satellite command and control application from it. And then you also had the uh, software components to populate the architecture. The domain analysis and engineering effort did not use any of the domain analysis methods that we saw in the uh, Understanding Relevant Domains module, but it did classify features as common and variant across the SSCS, DCCS, and Spacecraft C2 applications. And in fact, a lot of the early information came from the generalized requirements that had already been produced on the uh, SSCS effort. They also as part of the domain definition document came up with a terminology dictionary that defined what these features were. Again, something very useful to us and very useful to an organization that's trying to put together a team that needs a shared understanding of what they are trying to achieve. Although in this case, what I thought was interesting was the fact that they produced the domain definition document at all because this is a closely knit team. They're all in the same location. They're all well versed in the world of satellite command and control. And in that situation, it's highly unlikely or very unusual that an organization would un actually write anything down. But they took great pains to document a lot of the early domain engineering work in the form of the domain definition and the um, domain specification and they used that as part of the training of the organization as it ramped up from 20 or so people to 45 to 50 and also provided that to, or the plan was to provide it to reusers of uh, CCT. So the features and the requirements were classified according to the two main phases of ground station operation, execution and planning. and. They categorized them into groups that they called component categories, which to my mind is more like using design time terminology when you are analyzing the problem space. So they obviously had some targets in mind for these groupings of features and requirements, and they were already thinking in terms of potential assets and subsystems within uh, CCT. So the ultimate target of the categorization was we have the, the broad categorization into execution and planning, and then within these two major portions of satellite operations, which are reflected in the architecture structure, we classify the features and requirements within these so-called component categories, which ultimately ended up being implemented as multiple components consisting of multiple objects. I forgot to say that the language used in this case was uh, C++. They also identified some common services across these component categories that ultimately ended up being provided by an object request broker because this was an effort based on CORBA technology which is seems to have pretty much disappeared from the landscape these days. Common object request broker architecture for mediating the interconnections between uh, objects. So the domain definition document was the satellite command and control for dummies. The generalized requirement specification contained a lot of the early information about commonality and variability of requirements. And the specification document contained the UML diagrams and the interaction diagrams for how these features would interact within these different categories. The architecture documentation, as I said, resulted in a set of views that went beyond the basic 4 plus 1 views of Philippe Krushten. And the architecture documentation 
was spread over spread over several documents actually uh, a lot of the inputs to it came from the generalized requirement specification and the domain definition and specification document the model itself talked about the philosophical underpinnings of why you need an architecture and the um, architecture drivers and then the reuse guide would tell you here are the points of variation within the architecture and within the components that conform to the architecture and here's how you exercise those points of variation to create components that can be plugged into the architecture and let me just draw a quick diagram here the overall architecture had these two major portions of execution and planning and there was no direct interaction between these two major portions except through the, uh, the common services provided by the orb and the database so within each of these major phases of execution and planning you had a number of different interacting component categories and between execution and planning interactions mostly in terms of what they referred to as the persistent storage solution what other people would call a database this is using uh, CORBA terminology so the features and requirements were classified into categories supporting each of these major phases of execution and the architecture diagrams reflect that this is one of several diagrams that were produced for the execution portion of the architecture and for whatever reason whatever point they were making on this particular diagram the orb is not shown as part of CCT on other execution diagrams and on the planning diagram it is I don't remember why it's uh, excluded there but this is the execution side of CCT so you have a number of different component categories called control status history LRV is last recorded value OBP is the onboard processor modeling um, component or component category and there are multiple interacting components and objects within each of these categories to send signals to the front end processor receive telemetry streams in return archive the results and provide information to whatever clients on the ground station are monitoring the, stat the status of the satellite during a contact this is also like a context diagram for CCT of the kind that we saw in the uh, scoping and understanding relevant domains modules there's a similar one for the planning portion of the architecture so, and in this case the orb is shown within the overall CCT context so you have again multiple different component categories within the uh, planning portion of CCT and no direct interaction between this portion of the architecture and the execution portion of the architecture except through the uh, the persistent service and the persistent store the reuse guide explained to reusers first of all here's the set of variation mechanisms that we are using within CCT so it provided a definition of what each of these means and then provided an example in terms of actual CCT components of how you would exercise these kinds of variation mechanisms when you are adapting CCT components for use in a, uh, a ground station this is the basic six-step process that a product builder would have to go through to reuse the CCT assets so if you're a contractor that's been awarded the contract for the complete satellite command and control system you first of all have to figure out well I have to build the complete system 
what do I have by way of legacy systems that I can use for this, for both the ground segment and the space segment? What do I have or what can I acquire by way of commercial off-the-shelf software that would help with this? What kind of real-time interface products do I need to interface with the, uh, the front-end system and the antenna to uh, communicate with the satellite? I also need to select a CORBA vendor for the implementation of the object request broker. And in fact, on the CCT case study, what they found was, I think early on in the first increment, the CCT people were developing using an orb from one of the leading vendors at the time. The spacecraft C2 customer was using an orb from another leading vendor at the time. And even though CORBA is a standard, there are vendor interpretations mm -hmm. of that standard. Fortunately, these issues were discovered and remedied early on, which is another vote for an incremental approach to fielding a product line and fielding a core asset base to support a product line. So you as a product builder will have to select an orb to implement CORBA. And as a product builder creating the complete satellite command and control system, you're on your own when it comes to security. There's nothing in the CCT asset base that addresses the security needs of the complete satellite command and control application. So the CCT portion is totally non-classified, totally dealing with the routine ground operations of monitoring the health and status of the satellite. The security stuff is left to the people who are actually operating the payload on the um, satellite. After that, then, you have to incorporate the CCT assets into your uh, total product and deliver a final package as part of your contractual obligation. So this is a, a basic six-step process for somebody who's actually doing uh, product building. So CCT does not build product, but there's an internal organization, the application engineering organization within Raytheon, that would mimic at least some of this stuff to create a minimal working product. And in fact, the impetus from that came from uh, somebody in one of the early architecture evaluations where a person asked, what's the minimal set of components I could take from the CCT asset base and wire together that would send a signal to the satellite and receive something in return? And that prompted people to think of you know, we haven't really put together a minimal end-to-end, -end. you know, the, the hello world equivalent of a satellite application that would at least show a minimal proof of concept that these assets could be wired together before we hand them off to a uh, customer. The evaluations that were done on both the execution and planning portions of the architecture used an early form of what became the architecture trade-off analysis method. Um, and in fact, the, um, one of the things that we encourage people to do in an architecture evaluation is not only look at the functionality and the quality attributes that are a requirement for the systems you intend to build, but also be proactive about coming up with some growth or exploratory scenarios, some what-ifs that aren't a contractual obligation, but are things that could be requested in the future. So if the system is supposed to handle, uh, you're building an air traffic control system and you're supposed to be able to handle 50 aircraft in a segment, guaranteed the day will come when the 51st plane enters the sector. So what do you do? Well, now is an opportunity to explore what you might do and whether or not the architecture would be resistant to that kind of thing. So they're not necessarily contractually obligated requirements, but they are an opportunity to explore what happens if a customer makes these kinds of requests or a situation like this happens in the future. So in the case of CCT, they came up with some scenarios. Well, one of them was, what happens if we have to port this to a different orb? 
what happens if we have to port this to a different operating system. But there were also scenarios like CCT was designed to handle two simultaneous telemetry streams. What would have to change if it had to require if it were required to handle multiple simultaneous telemetry streams? CCT is designed to handle a single satellite. What would have to change in the architecture if you were required to handle a constellation of satellites? So it's not that these requirements were ever likely to happen, but this is an opportunity to do some early exploration when it's cheapest to do so and not lock yourself out of a, what in a commercial organization would be a potential business area. In the case of the DOD, it could be a mission area that would be served by a satellite that is flexible enough to go beyond its initial mission and accommodate, for example, a constellation of satellites. So as part of being proactive about your product line and as part of looking ahead to future features and requirements, you should also look ahead to how those features and requirements would show up in the architecture and what effect they would have on the architecture and whether or not you could put in some hooks and basically do some defensive architecting so that you're ready for potential changes like that. And a front end into that comes in the domain analysis section if you use change cases as a way of exploring the what ifs and you use scenarios as a way of exploring what would happen if we built a system with this set of capabilities? How would we expect our customers to use it? What kinds of changes would they likely come up with? And use that as an input to the scenario generation for the architecture evaluation. Because the architecture should be evaluated with respect to some operational scenarios that really get at what these quality attributes mean. It's not enough to say, this satellite, has, this satellite ground system has to be high performance or highly reliable or highly modifiable. What does that actually mean in terms of an operational scenario that will allow you to understand and then make changes that would not lock yourselves out of extensible solutions for the future? Anybody want to talk about how you currently evaluate architectures within your organization? I mean, how do you know if something is fit for the purposes for which it was intended? Do you rely on the domain experts, the architecture experts? Do you rely, rely on uh, design reviews? Do you have any way of assessing what we call quality attributes that are orthogonal to functionality? like performance, reliability, or scalability. John? I think I'd make the observation that the, depending upon the, the amount of ceremony involved depends on the size of the project being examined. I like the term ceremony. <laughs> <laughs> the architecture analysis ceremony. <laughs> Go on. So, so it, it will range from the info, relatively informal through to uh, an ATEM approach, depending upon... Uh, various factors. So you would actually use, if not ATAM, an ATAM-like approach that does an operational definition of quality attributes and comes up with scenarios. For, for projects that fall into that category. So again, the, the three-month project with four people gets... Exactly. The lightweight version. Yeah. Gets a different examination than yeah. the multi-year, yeah, 150-person yeah. project. In our organization, yeah. uh, we have you know, domain business units are there, and we have a domain uh, solution architect, which will come up with a architecture. And then if there is a, a, a integration between another domain through this particular project, then we will invite the other, the other, uh, stakeholders. The other uh, architecture architects and then their subject matter experts and talk over that and make sure that they're complying with their architecture as well. And if there is any uh, concerns and we bring in an enterprise architect to evaluate whether does it fit into the 
all the principles and guidelines and, and all those uh, compliance process. Yeah. So that's what we do. Yeah. Anyone else? So these are the kinds of specific practices that you have in your organization that can certainly be used to serve the needs of a, uh, a product line. In the case of CCT, there were no showstoppers discovered during the, uh, the architecture evaluation. And then component engineering is the group that implements the components in each of the component categories within the uh, execution portion and the planning portion of the, um, the architecture. And some of what they did reused some of the DCCS effort. There was a, a mandate that they had to create reusable components. There was also a mandate that they had to reuse as much as they could from the DCCS effort. The case study, unfortunately, doesn't say exactly how much they were able to salvage from the, uh, the, DCC effort, the DCCS effort. For uh, testing, you had multiple levels of testing being done by the different parts of the organization. The uh, component group at the, uh, or the domain engineering and architecture group doing internal testing, component development doing internal testing, then a handoff to the application engineering groups and the test engineering groups for more formal levels of system and integration testing. And at the end of the level three testing, that would be the handoff to the uh, spacecraft C2 customer. So for each increment, you had these different levels of testing ranging from unit testing all the way up to uh, integration and system testing. And for every increment of the six increments, you had a release, first of all, of core assets from the core asset base to the application engineering group using the test architecture to create a minimal application from these uh, components. And successive increments of increasing capability being handed off like that. After the application engineering group rings out all of the application or the integration problems and notifies the core asset base people of any fixes that need to be made, then there's a handoff from the core asset group to the spacecraft C2 customer. Once that handoff occurs, then any further discrepancies or bugs or requests for change are mediated through the sustainment engineering group. So again, this is part of the discipline of running a product line organization, setting up a structure like the sustainment engineering group. That was the terminology that uh, Raytheon used. Uh, some of our other customers don't even have that kind of terminology. But there is a conscious decision to assess all requests for changes and all requests for bug fixes with respect to their applicability to the specific product and the product specific components within that specific product or their applicability across the entire product line, particularly requests for change from customers. Requests for changes to an existing feature, requests for the addition of new features. Somebody has to be monitoring those so that the knee-jerk response isn't, yes sir, we will fix this for you, we will make this change for you. Not only will we do that, we'll put it into the core asset base. There has to be some arbitration on the effects of doing that. And there should be a part of the organization looking at trends of requests for change so that today's product specific features may be tomorrow's product line features. But you need to do a rational assessment of that and not pollute your core asset base with product specific stuff. And I don't think I need to say a whole lot about that. And I do believe I mentioned already about how the, there were representatives from the test engineering group and also from the spacecraft C2 test group 
participating in all of the standing meetings as a way of reducing risk on these large, expensive satellite development efforts. But for CCT, these are the kinds of outputs that were produced on this development effort over and above the typical kinds of CDRLs, contract data requirements list, that would be expected on a government contract. So you're expected to come up with a requirements definition document and a specification and a, um, all those other contractual obligations. And then in addition, the CCT effort created these. So there were some things produced and some activities introduced into the CCT process that were not envisioned originally when the contract was let. So the government did provide additional money to Raytheon to incorporate an architecture evaluation step, for example, and the government paid for the SEI's involvement as advisors in this. But these are some of the additional documents that were produced over and above a typical satellite contract, all based on this concept of we're now becoming a product line organization, so we produce some product line level documents like the domain definition, the generalized requirements, the domain specification, and so on, that would not be produced in a uh, single system contract. So they came up with a support plan for how you would manage the sustainment of the CCT asset base once products are fielded. They came up with a concept of operations, the architecture model, the reuse guide, a portability demonstration plan that would show how you can take CCT and port it to different platforms, different orbs. So very proactive about producing documents that would help a customer understand the rationale and the what we would call the production plan for how you would use CCT assets to create a full satellite command and control application. Any uh, questions, comments about some of those practice areas? I have a question Peter. on the six increments. The six increments, yes. Yeah. I would assume that most of the later increments added just components, new components, but how much did the architecture itself evolve over time, or was it largely fixed like in the first? Iteration? I think it was largely fixed within the first or second increment, yeah, yeah. A lot of the stuff was firmly in place by then. Because of their understanding of relevant domains and their, um, their earlier work that had been done on the generalized requirements and the quality attributes, um, I can't remember at which point in the increment cycle the architecture evaluations actually occurred. So I imagine there were some changes introduced by the evaluations, but they were not significant perturbations to the architecture. <laughs>